And the first item up is public comment. So is there anybody who has a public comment? I have Hideout. a public comment, yep. Um, so on your agenda today is a, um, a some draft legislation, um, but I'm gonna mention a couple of other pieces of legislation that are not on the agenda. Um, because one of them in particular arose out of a discussion that occurred at this meeting, oh, a year, maybe as much as two years ago. Um, you will recall that uh, there were some people uh, presenting from National Grid and, um, and maybe from Eversource but it, it was about the mass save program. And Chris Mason asked the question, uh, well, gee, how about uh, sharing some of the data for Northampton with the city of Northampton? And, um, and the, the woman from National Grid said, oh my God, you haven't received it yet? You know, and she said she would get it to him. And so I followed up with him a few months later and asked him what data she had been able to produce. And she said, none, uh, as it turned out that there weren't any data to share that were capable of being shared. So uh, nobody understands why, how that could be. But in any case, Lindsay Sabadosa has filed a bill to uh, require Mass Save to share data with municipalities by zip code. And that's a very short bill. Uh, it's basically, it says only that. It's uh, H3228. And um, uh, I'm, I, I'm hoping that it will get mushed in with a bunch of other things that are uh, intended to reform Mass Save. Um, but we, we don't know whether that will happen. So I wanted you to know about that. And then uh, also, um, both Lindsay Sabadosa and Joe Comerford have um, submitted bills that would expand the fossil fuel free pilot study to any community that desired to do to join it. And uh, that's relevant for us because we would like to join the pilot, but we're uh, we're kind of far down the, on the list. And uh, so if they limit it to 10, we will very likely not be included in those 10. So I wanted you to know about those. Um, that's H3227 and S2093. Um, and I can provide copies of these bills if you'd like. And I also wanted to mention that um, both of our legislators um, have a whole host of other bills that they have introduced that are very likely to be of interest to you all. Um, things like topics like uh, low embodied carbon for building materials, utility pricing, protecting consumers from uh, utility rate hikes, uh, protecting soil and trees and uh, solar development. These are, there are numerous bills. And so I just wanted to throw out a possibility that you might want to invite uh, Representative Sabadosa and um, Senator Comerford to one of your future meetings to present about those other bills. Thank you. Great, thanks, Adele. Um, I just read one comment about the um, pilot program. I think the um, Lindsay representative Sabadosa also noted that in order to be considered for the pilot, we'd have to have a number of things in place um, ahead of time. And I don't know that we've advanced at all. I don't know who was working on that before um, that went in to that mode. But anyway, just it's something if, um, folks wanted to work on. I think that's the only way we, it sounds like the city would be considered to be repla a replacement pilot city. Um, any other public comments? Okay, great. 
Um, I'm sure. Did I send out minutes for January? Um, I don't know if I sent them before the last meeting or not. Um, and I'm sorry, I have, having a, a brain block on this one, but I don't think I did. Um, so we may not have that one, but um, let me just do a quick check. Sorry about this. I'm a little sort of out of sorts to having, trying to figure out this ridiculous technology if at the last second, hang on. Um, let me just see. Yeah, um, I don't think I've sent the minutes, so we'll have to put them on for the next agenda. So um, let's go to the next item. Um, so we have on here, um, Councilor Maiori asked to have um, a representative from the Youth Commission, Elijah, talk about um, electric buses. And I'm not sure the depth or the um, the breadth of that conversation. So I'm just going to turn it over to Councilor Maori and Elijah, if you want to take up that yeah. um, item. Sure, thank you. I know we've discussed this before, if you've been on this. Uh, but um, just really wanted to check in. I, I know that the Youth Commission has been discussing it and really just wanted to circle back. It doesn't have to be an exhaustive discussion, but um, but yeah, just wanted to um, check in about it and keep keep that pushing that cart. So I was hoping we could have Elijah um, speak to it since I think uh, you're the best person to do so. Thank you for being here, Elijah. Yeah, sure, uh, of course. Um, I'm uh, happy to be here. As you, some of you may know, my name is Elijah Bacall. Uh, I'm a student at NHS and I'm the, the co-chair of the uh, Youth uh, Commission. Uh, thanks for uh, 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 having me. So um, yeah, I, I didn't prepare any kind of uh, formal presentation, but maybe I'll give kind of, um, just kind of in a, an abridged version of what our work on uh, electric buses has looked like over the past year and a half or so. So um, I we've been working pretty closely with uh, Susan Voss, former school committee member, and Mike Stein, current school committee member, um, on this issue over the past year and a half. We were actually originally approached about it as a commission uh, a number of years ago, pre-pandemic, by uh, Councillor May Mayori, uh, Rena Pai, and uh, uh, Susan Voss, and became kind of interested in it then, had discussions, but kind of became more involved um, last spring. Uh, we talked to we talked to people across the Commonwealth who had uh, had pilot programs or or tried to try to do this in their own communities, some successfully, on some unsuccessfully uh we talked to people uh from Amherst who had advocated for their participation in the um the state I'm forgetting which uh statewide uh, 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 department it was but there was a there was a pilot program statewide in like 2018 2017 uh with Cambridge Amherst and I I I believe a one or or, or or to uh, other, other cities as well. But we also talked to uh, uh, Dana Kruikshank, who's the transportation director of the Beverly Mass Public Schools, who gave us kind of a very encouraging picture. Uh, the, the, the Beverly program, they lease their buses and that's an example of a program that's working really well. We had a meeting with former superintendent provost uh, as well, uh, um, uh, Susan and, and Mike and I and other members of the committee had a meeting with former superintendent provost, uh, as well, as well as, uh, 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 uh Tammy uh, Lieber, who's the transportation coordinator uh, for the for the for the public schools. Um, that went 
that went okay. We, we still heard some, there were reservations from former superintendent provost at the time about the capabilities of electric buses to be reliable and, and you know, skepticism on how many of our routes with our routes the way they are with what the capabilities of electric vehicles are, how many of our routes truly could be covered by electric buses, but we continued to advocate for it. Um, we met, I wish that, um, I, I thought that um, school, committee school, school committee member Stein might uh, be coming today, um, uh, or uh, Susan Voss to, to discuss as well. I'm, I'm not sure if, if they were planning to or not, but any, anyway, we had, this meeting, um, I I'm, I tried to find the notes for it. I, I can't, unfortunately, I, I don't know where they went, but I, I will try to recount what happened in that meeting. Um, it was, um, we met with Tammy Lieber, who's again, the transportation coordinator for the public schools, uh, Dr. Pearson Campbell, the interim superintendent, and uh, 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 Bobby Jones, who's the business manager for the public schools. Um, they told us a few things. So what was encouraging to me as somebody who, who you know, believes in the idea of electrifying our, our, our uh, you know, NPS's fleet and, um, you know, has been advocating for it is the city actually did apply uh, for one of those, those uh, EPA grants. So the EPA actually is, is, you know, doing a huge round of, of grants uh, for localities to apply for a, electric school bus. I think it's called the EPA um, Clean School Bus Program. It's like $400 million from uh, the, the, the in infrastructure bill. And so Northampton applied for one of these grants. We, we did not re re receive it in the first round because, you know, and we didn't expect to. I mean, we're not a, a priority c c community uh, by their criteria. Uh, but, but, uh, Amherst actually did recently did receive one of these grants, so uh, that's kind of kind of I I encouraging. I think that a a community uh, you know with a similar profile to ours um, does seem to be able to receive it. One thing that we did hear, but I, I would say overall, um, the the takeaway from that meeting is that the school district, in in their view, the school district um, is just not ready yet um, to do this, given mostly a cost, but also the infrastructure that we have set up. So one issue that they brought up with applying for more of the EPA grant funds is that those funds can only be used to purchase a uh, vehicle. They can't be used to purchase like the infrastructure that you might need to run it. Um, and you have to spend the money within six, within six months. So within six months of receiving the grant funds, uh, you have to spend them. Um, and this is an issue for the city because we don't really have, a, according to, to, to them, we don't really have a reliable place to charge uh, electric vehicles right now. So in their view, it would be redundant to continue to apply for these funds when we would have to spend them within six months. And we don't really, e even if we receive this grant and we're able to purchase a, a vehicle and go through that process, we wouldn't necessarily have a reliable a place to put it. Um, so that was one issue that they, that they brought up. Um, another, let me think here. Um, an, another issue um, that they brought up. So one thing that we had, and I see as, as, as a school committee member, Stein has just um, um, joined, who's been uh, working uh, pretty closely with, 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 with us on this. So I'll just finish up here and then maybe he can add. Um, I've, I've just told them, I think, uh, Mike, you received an email from a member of our group. I just, I'm kind of running down the takeaways from the meeting that we had uh, with Tammy Lieber, with Tammy Lieber and uh, Bobby Jones. The first takeaway being that there's this six months, six month period if you receive an, EP, an EPA grant um, that you have to spend it. And since they don't think that there's a reliable place for us to put the vehicles right now, they don't want to apply for the grant and get it and then have no way to spend it. Um, the second concern um, that we heard, so one thing that we had been advocating for is um, the um, bidding process is coming up. So every few years, the city, um, the city's contract with a busing company is up and we take 
a bunch of bids on who's going to be the next company to, to supply the city with our buses for the next few years. So we contract with a company for our our uh, larger buses, like our big yellow school buses. We contract with a company called uh, uh, Durham right, right now, and our contract with Durham is about to be up. We had suggested to them to put some kind of 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 a, a language in our call for for uh, bids, like our our bidding language, to say that we would prefer, you know, we would prefer a bidder who would um, get our foot in the door, help us our city help our city get its foot in the door on EVs in some way. They went to some sort of uh, forum for local officials that was put on by a state uh, department, asked them whether they thought that this was a feasible idea, uh, that this was ad advisable, and they said no. So uh, apparently this person from, um, I forget which statewide department it was, but said that, you know, we would be shooting, you would be shooting yourselves in the foot if you did that. Um, th there's just, without without any um, 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 a grant, without any grant funds, there's just wouldn't be, um, that wouldn't be a, a, a feasible thing and you wouldn't get any bids. Um, you, you wouldn't get bids that would fit that criteria that would be within your price range as a, a, a city. So it, it seems like that route of doing it directly through the bus bidding process in that kind of more immediate way is going to be a bit of a dead end. And, 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 you know, we, we can talk, we, we can talk about, about that, but, um, uh, one thing that Mike uh, uh, suggested, and Mike, in, in, in a second, you can, you can add to this, is um, that we pursue electrification not through the avenue of the bidding, but instead through the avenue of um, the city's five-year capital improvement plan, which the, would be through the city council um, instead of through the school district. Um, 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 directly. So that's about all I have. Um, and you know, let me know if you have any questions. But I think I'll pass it over to Mike now, who can add on anything there. Yeah. Thank you, thank you Elijah. Um, Michael, can you unmute yourself? I don't know if you have. I can. Time. Oh, there you go. So why don't you? Yeah. Why don't we do a rundown, and then we can all ask some questions after you. You know. Uh, spoken as well. Great, and um, thank you so much for um, to Rachel for for having Elijah on the agenda to speak about this. He's been really just doing a lot of great work. And um, sorry, I was a little late. Work and some work things that kept me um, delayed. So I apologize. Um, we started late, actually. <laughs> oh, you did? Okay, I don't feel yeah. as bad, but I still <laughs> planning to be here earlier. Um, so uh, I'll just sort of try to add on. Um, you know, I, we've heard some of these um, limitations or difficulties before from the prior superintendent, and and to some degree, I think there's some reality that if we were trying to um, address this through the um, but through the contracting process this year, we probably wouldn't get any vendors, you know, applying, you know, to bid on our work. Um, because of what their infrastructure is and what we don't really have set up here. Um, the other sort of wrinkle to this that I, I'm not sure if Elijah talked to is the way the district provides transportation is somewhat complicated um, in that we have a fleet, a small fleet. Like if you've ever been to JFK, you'll see there are some buses parked in the back lot there by the sledding hill. And those are buses that the city owns. Um, they're not the largest school buses, they're of different classes, and we have employees that are actually town or city employees that drive those buses. But then we also have a contract with a private provider to do a certain number of busing routes, uh, provide both the drivers and the buses, and those service most of the transportation needs for both Northampton Public Schools and the um, vocational school. So the, it's like a kind of a complicated tapestry of, of, of things that are going on there, depending on the routes and depending on the schools. Um, so it just adds a level of complexity to figure out how do we get some traction. I was hopeful that 
if we're able to get the first grant they applied for for that bus, it would jumpstart us to get some decisions on electrical infrastructure and where we might be able to house more. Um, and you know, we didn't get that. It's unfortunate. Um, and you know, my my thinking has really been um, if we are going to make significant capital investments in the next five years, partially um, around climate and climate infrastructure, that whatever the city is doing around electrifying its fleet, um, that this should be part of the conversation. And then I think on the other side of the, the coin, the school committee, and this is what I'm pushing for, needs to really look at the model of transportation and whether or not we want to bring, and it may be more cost effective for us to bring it all in-house to no longer be doing these bidding. Um, where we really overpay is in special education transportation, pay extremely high rates for that. So that's sort of another avenue where we may be able to realize savings um, in those costs and hopefully help offset some of the costs of electrification. So I, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm disappointed about sort of the roadblocks we hit, but um, also grateful for the work that's been done and, and trying to think a little more broadly about how we might draft on some of the larger citywide initiatives to include these elements. So. Uh, uh, thank you, um, Mike. Uh, I, I can call a call on people. Uh, that would be great, Elijah, because I actually have to, now I have to drive for just five minutes. <laughs> Sure, sure. Okay. I'll, I'll listen, uh, but, but you can direct the, the question. One of those uh, days. I'm a, great. Uh, Councillor uh, 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 Elkins? Um, yeah, so I just wanted to um, just sort of uh, pipe in and add in a little bit of um, insight about the um, for, because I've been on the Capital Improvement Projects um, Advisory Committee. Um, so um, the I, just a couple of things to add in there, which is, I mean, uh, Mike, your description of sort of the bifurcation of the sort of mini buses and the use across departments versus the big school bus um, and the way those are are dealt with. Um, I, I guess I want to just sort of offer some reassurance or that it's it's not there may be a little bit of a chicken and egg situation happening here, which is the, because we can't get the grants for the, um, it's, it's not just that we can't get the grants, um, you know, it, it may not make, you know, they're prioritizing when they're maybe building that infrastructure or adding in that infrastructure. The other thing that we, that I learned um, from the CIP committee um, is that the availability of electric, um, particularly the minibuses, because that's what's within the purview of the city to buy, is that they're just not available. Like, on what what is even on the market, there is an availability, and that they aren't quite there yet in terms of having true, um, you know, viable electric options. Anyway, so it's not so the, I. Um, because I, I just want to assure you and thank you, Elijah, for your work on this, um, that that those questions are also being asked at that level um, and looking ahead to the CIP um, sort of uh, agenda and projects going forward. And the other part of it is that the rec department and Smith Volk and the school, they're coming with the request for these for updates and they need them. Um, many buses um, and truly they're being asked every year to go back and be like try to make that bus hold on one more you know one more year a little bit longer so that there will be more availability on the market um and better um better technology so um so i just wanted to sort of add that 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 is out there it's definitely on the mind of the mayor and on the uh council uh in terms of the cip and and the department heads and things like that. So um, I do, I, I can't help but think that the the big school bus situation, that that is gonna be a tough nut to crack and um, will be, until the school bus companies have that technology and can make those investments, I, it's, I, it's hard to imagine when that will be possible, but um, I don't mean to be pessimistic about it, but what's in the city's control um, in terms of the 
the mini buses. I, I, that's on the horizon, I think, relatively soon. And with that, I would guess that the infrastructure will come to support it. Yes. Uh, well, uh, thank you. Uh, just to, I'll I, I'll get to uh, 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 other questions, but just a, a quick a follow up on on what you said. So, uh, are the kind of um, a, a chicken or the egg situation with the loans and uh, the the mini buses and as as you said and uh, the 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 vans. Um, sorry, not not the loans. The the the. Uh, 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 grants. So one thing that we heard uh, from Bobby and Tammy is that apparently the city actually does have, or uh, the, the 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 public schools do have an electric van right now, but they don't have. The city doesn't own a charger, uh, like doesn't own somehow doesn't have a reliable place to charge it. So the person who drives the van goes. To different oh no it's it's not maybe it's not nps maybe it's just some city city department has this van that they don't really have a reliable place to charge um and they have to kind of find chargers all all uh, uh, around the uh city and uh, apparently also the the terms of the epa grant are that you have to spend it on a vehicle you can't spend it on like the the charging station or even like the you know getting the uh electrical uh wiring into the the building that you need it, it to be in to charge it like into the the ground that you need right so like there's a lot of things that have to happen um before a vehicle can reliably go and they're what they were saying is that it's it would be just redundant to apply for more of these grants to buy vehicles when we don't really have places to charge them and they said that they've the city has been scouting out like land that we could like you know buildings that we own land we own that we could put chargers in but we just haven't found that place yet so does that sound does that sound like a a correct account to you more or less of the situation now or no i i mean pat you can probably speak to this but the fire department has charging stations we've got charging um so that's a dedicated public you know off street space plus we have station we have charging um docks at um at various other you know i don't know if the van would fit in the parking garage but we have other public parking spaces even if the fire department wasn't open um, the city uh, in this year's CIP, there is a request for one eight passenger van, I believe, for the school department. Um, but, um, you know, that was the only request that came through for that. Uh, 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 okay. Um, uh, 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 ben? Yeah. Um, so this is great, uh, great research. Um, you know, I I talked with you maybe it's more than a year ago uh, with with your group, and you you guys learned a lot. And in that time, I also learned a lot um, on on the same subject. So um, I I just want to say I'm 100 percent in favor of electrifying 100 percent of of transportation. Oh, except where I even more prefer human powered transportation. Um, and I think that improving bus and expanding school bus <laughs> is a way to solve a traffic problem that it appears both at uh, the, the high school and at, at uh, JFK. So, you know, if you could just get more people to ride the bus instead of be driven and dropped off by their parents, that would solve a problem for the city that is potentially going to drive us towards an expensive solution that we might not even need if we could do it with buses. So that said, I think this would be a terrible thing to spend capital budget on um, because a, almost as soon as we got everything in place, it would be outdated. Um, and the other thing is just look at the conversation we just had, all the complexity about where are we going to put the chargers and what buses are available and we're depending on uh you know so we're getting some some feedback about what specific bus models are available this is way outside of our wheelhouse and i almost never um am a supporter of gordon's esco model 
you know, that, 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 uh, that, that he's pushing for buildings. And that's because buildings are capital uh, investments of the city. They don't go anywhere and they, and they last for an incredibly long time. And they're, and they're also unique. But school buses are a modular thing. They, they're built in a factory. And they, so they have a different characteristic. In this case, I would strongly recommend that, and I know that you um, talked to, um, uh, what was uh, the name of the city in um, uh, on, on the East East. I've, 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 what was it? I've, I've, Beverly. Beverly, that was it. Yeah. So the way that Beverly did it and the way that other people are doing it, and there, there are a few of these, but really Highland uh, Fleets yeah. is the company that does this. And I would, the reason to look at this group is it's all they do. And right now, if we were to, let's say we buy a small bus, you know, like one of the small ones, like the ones we own, that basically becomes a liability that we own until we just can't maintain it anymore. And we are subject to those fluctuating fuel costs and the cost of, of ownership. Their model is that we pay essentially a a, an annual stable fee for um, the transportation service. And so they own the buses, they manage the buses, they train our people how to maintain them um, or they, um, they fund employees. So they, they finance however whatever model has to work for the city. And they also do things like, you know, so we had the issue of, oh, I don't think that the electric buses can do our routes. Well, they look at they look at the routes and they redesign routes because again, that's something that they they have an expertise in, basically to match the routes to the buses and the buses to the routes, um, and then they build and manage the construction of the depots to upgrade uh, to to run these bu buses, and the reason they can do that is because they also have expertise in off peak charging and discharging. So they make use of these giant rolling batteries as a way to basically um, make a profit by managing the batteries better. And all we have to know is that they're going to have fully charged buses in the morning and in the afternoon, and everybody gets to where they need to be. Um, and then the city doesn't have to do anything but budget for a regular uh, payment, which we would normally budget for fuel costs. And if you had a year, like, uh, you know, somebody invades Ukraine, all of a sudden fuel costs get very high and everyone's worried about how to do that. So that's my, my general view is this is an area where a company like that is much better than a capital investment. Yeah. So thanks for bringing that up. I, 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 I see Mike, um, uh, I just want to say, so we actually did get in touch with Highland after meeting with uh, Dana Kruikshank, uh, who's the transportation director in in uh, Beverly. Uh, we got in touch with we got in touch with Highland. We met a number of times with uh, Jason Raposa, who's a business um, manager there. When we had a meeting with the superintendent. Um, back in like spring 2022, we actually had Jason um, from Highland participated in that meeting and gave a, a presentation to former superintendent a provost. And one of the encouraging things that we heard from Tammy in that meeting is that she's actually still uh, in touch with Jason. Um, so um, I think their concern around Highland was one that I think there there is just still the issue of cost, that their fees just too expensive at this point for the city. And also that um, there's a limited amount of grants that can cover Highland because the grants generally cover the purchase of electric infrastructure as opposed to the uh, leasing of it. So, so that's kind of a difficulty, which is that Highland would be easier, but we wouldn't necessarily be able to get grants to, to do it. Another issue, a, a big issue for, for Tammy with Highland is also that Highland, they provide uh, everything it's it's true they call it a a, a a turnkey solution like they you know they 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 provide every, everything you just pay the fee the one thing they don't provide is the, 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 the drivers so when we lease uh buses from durham 
Durham provides the drivers as well. So, you know, Tammy was saying that if if we leased from Highland and the city now becomes responsible for the, those drivers and those drivers become city employees or city contractors, then that like opens up a whole new world of uh, logistics that have to be figured out. One in terms of like finding those drivers, there you know, there's not there's not a ton of people who are like available to do that kind of work necessarily in in this labor market and also that the city now has to provide like a like a place for those drivers to use the bathroom and have breaks and stuff so so that is an issue that they raised uh, with 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 highland but i totally agree with you i mean i think highlands i think for a city looking to like make the transition quicker i think highland if we could if the funding could be figured out, I think Highland is a, a is a, a it would be a a really good way to go. Um, I, Thanks. I, um, I was just going to say, like before, I wanted to jump in before um, Gordon um, steps in and just comment on um, Ben's comment about trying to get um, more people riding the bus. Um, another issue with that is um, to reduce the number of people who are getting dropped off is um, relates to the fee that the school committee assigned, you know, 10 years ago for busing. And that has a big impact on parents' decisions to drop their kids off instead of paying for the bus fee. So mm. we can make that change right away by um, pulling back on that and, in, and then thereby encouraging more people to get on the bus and take agree. the bus. Um, instead of um you know having individually being individually dropped off yeah um gordon i think you were next thank you, thank you i appreciate it uh this has been an incredible conversation so i appreciate being able to, to jump in here i'm going to go back to kind of where you started elijah um one of the things that you said that the problem right now is not really just with the cost of vehicles but it's really that we don't have the infrastructure to support them, even if we got them. So maybe focusing our energy right now on going after the buses is kind of putting the cart before the horse. It sounds to me like what we really need to be doing is focusing on an energy infrastructure project here. The, 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 if we look at buses as a way to move students around it's pretty hard to justify the cost of of investing in these in these vehicles as vehicles right but if we look at these vehicles not as a way of getting students moved around but as giant portable batteries all of the sudden when we're looking at the city's infrastructure and our ability to be resilient in the face of uh, say a, a snowstorm that drops three feet of heavy snow on us in March uh, and knocks out power for uh, days and days. If we had a fleet of portable batteries that we could simply drive to our critical infrastructure and plug in, all of the sudden the cost of investing in these buses starts to make a lot more sense. And we also need to realize that a fleet of buses uh, would be a lot of power storage. So if we work with the utility companies to site the bus charging depot at a tie-in that works properly for the utility provider, then we could use these batteries to smooth loads from uh, intermittent sources uh, across the larger grid. And that would be of great value to the utility company. And when you start talking to them about providing a service like that, then they start being interested in providing the infrastructure necessary for it. And that's how we get it, the money for that. So we have to bring the utility companies in and we need a skilled team of people to do that like Ben and my, no, <laughs> Ben's shaking his head. Like, ben, like who, Highland, so who, not who like is, me. Ben, who's the skilled team that we need to do that? Well, that's precisely why I think a company like Highland that's already figured it out, already has the relationships, 
already has done the engineering to be able to have an algorithm that responds to the um, to the grid and that can do arbitrage. This is not something a city wants to create a department to go and do. I don't think. I, I agree. I agree. I completely agree with that. The the I think that what what I also heard in the conversation was that we already have a team of of bus drivers and a small fleet of vehicles that we own. So it sounded to me like there were some some suggestion that that people are feeling like uh, expanding that might be the way to go. I think that if we own these assets, it allows us to deploy them. I think that if we just lease from a turnkey company, then we no longer really own the assets. And I think that we need to look at these as potential assets. Do, do you not do you not agree with that, Ben? My understanding based based on things that, things I've heard and discussions with Highland and people associated with them has been that they actually want to make those buses function as a service as the rolling battery service you're describing. Right. Um, so that it's not about their ownership and you only get the service that, that you know this, that you're paying this thing for. It's about deploying it because they actually make money mostly by, controlling the charging. So yeah, you, you may be right. My impression from the the V to G process, uh, vehicle to grid is uh yeah, where you like use the battery to sell power back to the to the uh um uh, 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 grid how you you know you make money from that is you charge it during the day when the demand is lower and then you sell it at night. Uh when the demand uh, uh, is uh, uh, is higher. So Highland does that themselves. When you lease a bus from Highland, you you as a city are not really involved in that process, I don't think. What Highland does is they just do that with their buses when they're not in use to try to make back, like to try to recoup some of the costs that's involved in um, their operations. Uh, so it's true that if we, but oftentimes the V to G is actually really helpful in that it allows Highland to not charge the city as much. So for example, in the case of Beverly, what Dana Kruikshank, the transportation director told us is that the V to G covers, um, the city of Beverly is only charged for the bus and the infrastructure and the charging and whatever, but not for the actual electrical power itself because the V to G actually um, is, is equal to or greater than the cost of charging of the power that um, um, charges the bus. But that's not something that the city of, of, of um, Beverly is actually involved in at all. That's just what Highland has told them is the reason for, you know, this is why we're not charging you for the power is because we've been able to recoup the cost in this way. But it's true that we, if to use the, to, you know, to actually use the buses in the like rolling battery, uh, you know, climate resiliency capacity that Gordon is s suggesting, we would, we would actually have to, to uh, uh, own it. The V to G is not something if we leased from Highland, that's just something that Highland does th th themselves. Yeah. Right. At Thanks. least that's my underst understanding. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Michael? Yeah, I mean, just to chime in, it's, it's super interesting to hear you all um, discuss this, because I sort of see an argument for both what um, Ben and Gordon were saying, like there's two different ways to look at it. And I, I remember at least in our conversations with Highland, um, you know, like that big barrier is like everyone else that provides these sort of lease busing services provides drivers and deals with that whole problem. And so that is a barrier for them to enter a lot of markets. And so like, it's unclear how one solves that, that piece of it or how the market will figure it out. And the other part of it was, you know, they were, I don't know if this happened. I don't think it did. They were supposed to get back to Tammy with some site evaluations of our routes to really tell us what was, possible or what it would look like. And I don't think we got them. And, you know, aside from Beverly, I know they're trying to roll out a few other sites, but they're, they're not super well established. It's a compelling model, right? For all the reasons that 
uh, Ben says, like it does do all these things. It's just, have they been able to deliver and can they even get the buses from the supply chain? You know, there's a lot of sort of challenges that they have. Um, and even just looking at the busing costs, I mean, Tammy had priced out um, placing one of the larger buses that the city owns. And it would be, I think, right now, right? If you could get it, it would be about $330,000 for the electric version and 92,000 for the diesel, right? And obviously there's a lot more cost, but we're talking, you know, multiples of, of three before you even get to the charging infrastructure. So I don't know, I, I do sort of, I, I kind of want to look at both avenues. What would it, you know, my, in my ideal world, right? It'd be sort of like, how do we price it out to understand it as this city owned asset that can do things versus what real leasing models might be available in the next three years, five years that might pop up that would take care of that. We don't have those costs, but yeah, there's just so many pieces of it. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah. I, I think that this would be a really a perfect example of uh, a big piece of infrastructure that we know that we're going to need to buy that is really a perfect model for using, a fi using financing. And if we use the ESCO model to finance buses along with financing upgrades of our wastewater treatment facility, along with financing, um, you know, any number of different things that need to happen around the city, uh, and there's plenty to do, it, it, the savings wouldn't necessarily cover all of the costs, but it could cover a lot of it and we could raise the funds otherwise to cover the remainder. And we could we could put this cost over 20 to 25 years. You know, when you go with an energy service company model and they build you a, an all-encompassing project that includes your utility tie-ins it includes all of the software needed to manage it. It includes all of the infrastructure for charging the buses. It includes all of the infrastructure for plugging the buses into your buildings. It includes all of the infrastructure for running your heating systems and your water heating off of those batteries. It, it pays for all of that. It doesn't pay for every penny of it but it would cover a lot of it. And it would give us a way to spread these large capital expenditures that are gonna be necessary for, for our, our dealing with climate change over 20 years, instead of trying to build them into our five-year capital improvement projects, which is really going to break the bank. We can't pay for sustainability over five years. That's just stupid. Thanks, Gordon. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> really good conversation. Not sure what the next step is, but appreciate the um, comments and Rachel for bringing the um, um, this issue through the Youth Commission to the table. Thank you, Elijah, um, for coming to present on that. Um, definitely a discussion to sort of figure out not just with this school fleet obviously but we have other fleets in the city too yeah i just um, want to say thank you okay. yeah i'm sorry i just want to say thank you to, to michael and elijah for um for joining us you know i i think it was just useful to kind of get an update and get refreshed we have talked about this on nesc and i don't want to be redundant but i think we need to come back you know things are changed really fast and um some really good uh, food for thought and we i'd be happy you know we could we could you know we can as we get more specific, we, we all could come back or, you know, we could talk more about it. Um, but this is a good one just to get us all on the same page. So thank you. Yeah, of course. Uh, I look forward to to continuing uh, the, the discussion. Likewise, thank you so much. Thanks. Um, okay. Next up is um, use of funds for from the Energy and Sustainability account. Uh, Pat, you had to pitch that you wanted to bring requests. Uh, yes, there's um, several unfinished items from Chris's um, 
work from last year. Um, one of the items was uh, working with a company called American Plant Maintenance and um, dealing with some uh, common maintenance issues with steam traps that uh, are, need to be done every five years. In the, um, we had the city buildings done last year, uh, like City Hall, which has steam. And uh, this year, uh, we have uh, both Leeds and um, Jackson Street School. Uh, the APM, American Plant Maintenance, uh, works with uh, Matt Mateague at uh, Eversource. Uh, last year, our HVAC tech walked through Leeds and um, Jackson to do a survey of what steam traps needed to be um, repaired, not repaired, but maintained. They take them apart and uh, rebuild them or replace them to make sure they're working properly. Uh, these are components on the steam system that basically save a lot of energy. Uh, and if they're not maintained, you lose a lot of energy. So um, we have a proposal uh, basically from APM and Eversource where Eversource pays for half of the survey and the city covers the other half. However, if we elect to do the work at both locations, Eversource pays for the full uh, cost of the survey, as well as half the actual work. So the uh, amount of uh, work, uh, the cost of the work is approximately $21,000. And the city would be on the hook for, um, $10,934.50. Uh, and I'm asking, because I do not have these funds available in the central services budget. Uh, I've spoken to Tony Kuznirs, who does not have the money in the school budget. And it seems like a worthwhile effort uh, to spend. I mean, we're getting a lot of um, utility money here. It's low hanging fruit. Uh, to take the money from the uh, energy and sust sustainability account uh, to pay for the work. Um, and that's about it. Any questions? Gordon? Oh, yeah. Um, one, so, so Pat, you said this is for cleaning the steam trap, steam traps. Is that what I'm hearing? Correct. Well, cleaning, yeah, take them apart and rebuilding them or replacing them as needed. Yes. Okay. So, what? How old is that system that we've got there? At Jackson Street and. Yeah. The system itself. Yeah. Uh, 40, 50 years, I guess. So this is like time. changing so. filters on an HVAC system. Right. So Basically, you're going to go in there, uh, and yeah. you know work on the steam traps to make sure they're operating correctly. Yeah, and ju just to be clear, I absolutely support giving giving the money for that. Um, but my, my point is that this is exactly why we need to look at a performance contract, because if we're spending our kind of emergency funds or our strategic funds on cleaning steam traps of systems that are 45 years old, then we should be really looking at replacing them entirely. And we need to find a financing mechanism to do it. And so, so you know, what, what's that gonna be? What, Ben, you're shaking your head. What, what's the way to do this? Like, what, how, how do we not have steam traps in the buildings anymore? That, so this is why, um, I'm sorry if I'm speaking out of turn. This is why I, I would not actually want to approve sustainability funds to keep going for longer an inherently unsustainable system um, and thereby disguise the cost. So now like you've got all these ways to make it look as though it's not very expensive to have a steam system, which then when you're looking at your comparative cost of doing like in Leeds, they're already the intention of, of doing a VRF system in the portion that requires steam heat, which would allow you to take the rest of it completely off of steam. That gets delayed more and more because 
looks like Steam doesn't really cost you that much to own, but here we're getting lots of money to make it look like it's cheap. I'm not Martha. sure. I'm not sure I agree that that's a fair characterization. Um, I mean, I, the the long term, um, uh, there are a lot of people thinking long term about, in particular, the schools, but all the city buildings about the the long term plan to to make them sustainable and and reliable. But they have to also work now. Um, so I, I, it is. Uh, uh, it, it's not really an option to have them not work put that now. On the capital in, budget. As, yeah, so put that's on capital the, budget, that's, not yeah, on sustainability. Of, exactly, right. that's part of the city's responsibility to maintain its systems. Why is that the responsibility of of Energy and Sustainability Commission, where we're supposed to be putting our funds towards making the city better equipped and more resilient? Well, Pat, but, can I ask you? Um, you know, because we just went through the CIP process. This is something that sort of came up, and the shortfall came up sort of after the fact, and this is a, a, a uh, an available way to, um, to to meet the immediate need. Is that sort of how it's viewed? Um, it wasn't my impression that this was just not funded or anticipated, but things come up and and uh, this was an available source. I, Carolyn, it's kind of how I you. look at it, but I, but I could be wrong. We had, uh, yeah, well, I think that's been a major problem uh, that everyone's looked at this as a thing to raid, to, to bandage their somehow related to energy problem, you know, so that's not, you know, that's, that's, that's a problem for me. I don't like that that fund is looked at it that way. What, uh, so we had, I had asked for a report on how much we have in that fund and how that fund is funded. Carolyn, did you put that together for us? Um, I asked uh, uh, Pat, uh, did you have that information um, on the account? Um, I don't have the information in front of me, but it's approximately okay. one hundred fifteen thousand okay. dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we just had our communication lines um, crossed. Um, so um, you think there's a hundred. 15,000 in that um, line uh, um, account now. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Um, so yeah. I think it's not, so I'm just checking. Um, I don't think it's something that we track internally in our budget. Um, so that's why I didn't um, have that. So if it's 115 plus or minus, and then this would be you know, 11,000 out of that. Right. Um, and how is it fin financed? How, how do we fund it? And are you, uh, it? How do you fund the yeah. 11,000? No, it's energy no, the, the, the fund, the fund yeah. that, the, that this commission oh, has awesome. control over, how is it funded? Uh, is it a is it a charge on people's utility bills? No, is no, it, no. It's a revolving fund. It's a revolving fund. Can you tell me? So, can you explain that to me? Sorry, pardon my ignorance. You, you save you save money by saving energy, and yeah. some of that savings goes into the revolving fund to seed more energy savings. Um, at, which was I think Chris probably set that up may, maybe more than a decade ago or something. You know, it's it's been around for a while. Um. And that's why, again, just for me, for, for the principal, I say $10,000, could that pay for somebody to pursue additional funding to, to fund the already designed project for Leeds Elementary, for example, that would then take it off of steam? They would eliminate those steam traps. And that would be a, a better long-term investment than fixing steam traps that we hope to not use. Right. And so, like, I'd rather spend the $10,000 to get the rest of the money to do the project that's already been designed for which we already spent a fair amount of money to get the design done. Is that in the same building, Ben? Yes. Yeah, so, Leeds, yeah. Leeds has an old section in a, in a 1990s section, and the old section is the one that requires steam. Once the VRF systems are in place, and you've got your heating and cooling, by the way, in those classrooms then the whole building, the rest of the building is hydronic, it's circulating hot water, and you don't actually require steam. So then those steam traps disappear. 
Okay, so what's been the whole, are we waiting on funds? Money. To... Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it, okay. it's a very expensive project to put in VRF. Right, and so how were we planning on paying for that? Uh, well, I actually don't know the, the latest. I, I mean, Chris was, you know, at the time in the process of, of trying to pursue grant funding. Presumably you would go to DOER, to the Green Communities uh, Grant. And in, again, in my opinion, that ten thousand dollars is better spent to as part of the as part of somebody's effort to pursue that uh, um, DOER funding. So it sounds to me like the earliest that system could be in place is three three to four years. No, not necessarily. How how, how would we get it in faster if we're writing grants and then waiting for funding, and then get, getting engineering and design? Because it's already, the engineering's already done. It's, okay. That, Engineering on awesome. that one is is already done, I think. Okay, so it's a, a matter of so so. All right, you know, I I still I think that I I think that that okay. in 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 the you know like is there something that we is there something that we could do do both here? Can we get this paid for just to, to bandage this since we have the money? Okay, and since it is ostensibly related. But is there some way that we can apply an equal amount of funds towards moving that project forward? And is there some way that we can get repayment uh, out of capital funds from next year? So that fund is specifically funded out of credit. So we, there's not a transfer from the general fund or capital fund back into this fund. It's specifically set up just to take those um, revenues that come from um, the sale of energy renewable energy certificates. So okay. that wouldn't you wouldn't be able to do that. So the what's it's on the table is a request for the funds from this, and you could make a statement about not wanting to spend any more capital type expenses on you know old systems um, either now or in the future. Um, if that's the will of the committee to say, okay, this is a one-off, but we're not gonna be the funding arm for these um, maintenance um, projects. Yeah, this is, this is like the third or fourth year in a row of my serving on this commission. And every single year we have had a different department come and gobble that entire fund up and we haven't spent a penny of it. So shame on us for not finding a better way to spend it thus far. But these infrastructure projects have got to be properly funded. You know, the, this, 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 this money needs to be going towards real sustainability efforts and, and steam traps is not gonna cut it in the future. Um, you know, that's gotta come out of the proper budget. And, and I, I really think that we need to look at how we're going to finance all of these projects and stop imagining that we're simply going to get enough person power to write all the grants that we would possibly need to get this done at every single one of our buildings. Like, how are we going to do that? We have a commitment that we made that we would be sustainable and would be carbon free as a city by 2030. How are we going to write enough grants to get there? We don't have the people to do it. We need to hire an outside company to help us. I mean, isn't that the role of the new uh, the new department that the, the the mayor just put in place? I mean, I that's we're not, we're not going to write grant that that department still can't write enough grants. We need to have a better strategic direction here. We do not have a strategic plan in place for how we are going to get ourselves to carbon neutral by 2030 when we're running out of time. Right. To get yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't, I'm sorry. I, 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 sure. I've got, I, this is uh, within what can be accomplished in government um, and within the purview where you're not a private, you know, the city is not a private business that can just, uh, you know, generate capital and spend it on whatever it wants. And, I have given and, you, I have given you a it, funding mechanism repeatedly that no one has bothered to, to go after. And you're constantly just negative. We can't do this. We can't do that. We not just, we need to start thinking about what we can do. 
And how well, I don't think I'm negative, it? Gordon. I just think that, I think that I that, that's uh, fine. That, that's for everyone to decide. But well, and that's fine. That, I mean, I just I, I guess I just I'm not sure I agree with the characterization that that uh, that there aren't citywide policy initiatives going on to try and address these. Are they perfect? Are they going to get every Thing done, but I mean, I, I, you know, you know, candidly, I hear a lot of things being suggested that actually, in fact, are already underway and are in the process of long-term capital funding as a part of the CIP. So, I mean, I'm just I welcome you to look closely at the CIP and the city budget, you know, going out forward. And 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 I, they also, I'm sorry, just the issue of what we're going to do about in particular the schools and the school buildings and what is going to stay and what is going to be re, re uh you know upgraded what is going to meet the demographic needs and the educational needs of our school of our students is uh, it is a 20 it's a monumental project and it's not i, I mean it, it's i i just it's not we're not going to hire an outside consultant to write a bunch of grants to get that done that's not what we um, need. We need an energy service company to come in and analyze. All energy service companies are about their own. You don't profits. know anything about energy service companies. I worked Gordon. for one for a decade. How Gordon, can I, you I don't tell know about me? That. How can Gordon. you tell me how energy service companies work? I, my father, how can you tell us in these department company. heads I what they know about policy and government's policy for a decade? Gordon. You have no idea what what they do. If you think that they're just there for their own money, the whole purpose of an energy service company is to to, to give you savings that pay more than the cost of the project that you do. Because that if they you, if they from. don't. If, no, you profit from it. You get all of the infrastructure. What? How stupid and short-sighted is that? That's unbelievable. They profit from you getting all that new infrastructure? Oh. Woo. Gordon, Gordon, yeah, I think you're a little cool. bit over the yeah. top. I think we need to move on and make a determination about what's on the table instead of arguing whether your solution is better than anybody else's. So can we bring this back to the agenda item and how the committee might want to pursue um, this request for $10,700. Uh, yeah, can I just interject? Um, it, it is a sensitive subject, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm just trying to follow up on some unfinished items that Chris was working on. I, I don't have the money for it. And it does seem to be low hanging fruit. However, I'm, I'm on a learning curve here as well, if you feel that this money should be used differently, uh, that I, that's a valid point. Um, and we'll just have to suffer the consequences. Uh, but that is energy going down the drain. But, you know, maybe we'll, you know, the problem is, is we are coming out of the heating season and my budget covers, uh, you know, maintenance and making sure the buildings are operating during the cold months. Now we're through that now, and we have spent that money. And um, you know, when there's a power outage, like last Tuesday, when the city was closed, I had everyone in my department working. In fact, they worked 10 hours that day. Uh, there were power outage. And so we do maintenance on a daily basis, but we don't have the money in our budget to do this. And it does seem to be low hanging fruit. However, I don't want, I do want to understand that if this money is not earmarked for the, I just thought myself, well, utility company is real. I mean, right now, if we don't do this, we'll have to pay for half the survey and not do the work. So that doesn't seem to make sense. But then again, if you feel that the money in this account should not be used for this, it's a valid point. However, the consequences are that these things will not get done. Now, looking forward, I mean, the ERV system at Leeds is being redesigned right now because we couldn't afford what the cost estimate told, it, told us what it was. So we're hopefully going to be going out to bid on that in the fall. But I'm sure we're going to be looking at the sticker price and, you know, it's, we're going to be shocked. 
where that money is coming from and the timeline it's gonna to take to accomplish that is years down the road. It's not gonna happen next year. So the steam traps for next year will be running as they are now. So, you know, I, I, I think you have a valid point, but I also think that this is low hanging fruit. So I thought I'd, you know, throw it out there on the table. I understand if 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 you vote against it. Um, I would move um, to approve the funds for. I'd move to approve the requested funds. Well, okay. Is there a second, and then there can be discussion. I'll second. Okay, discussion. Um, Adele, you had your hand raised. Do you want to speak on this issue? I wanted to uh, comment that what I heard Chris Mason say years ago is that the, the money in this fund uh, comes from renewable energy credits from the landfill solar array that are sold to the utility companies. Um, what, I, what I don't know is how long you can keep the funds. Um, and, and perhaps what I just said is the same thing that uh, Carolyn just said, but um, um, but I don't know if you can carry over the balance from year to year. And if so, that would argue, uh, that would add something to this conversation. Thank you. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's no, there's not a time limit um, that the, the, it's not a use it or lose it by the fiscal year. It's sort of a revolving fund. So. Um, Michael. Sorry to chime in too. I just um, in the just wanted to say, you know, in the budget and property subcommittee I'm on for the school committee, we've been trying to talk a little bit about um, building issues and enrollments and this type of stuff. So I would love to be part of or help collaborate with any sort of larger conversations about building use and uh, rehabbing and get, getting them ready for, you know, a resilient future. So if there's any ways we can help or collaborate, you know, we would love to do that. So thank you. Thanks. I, I think just to follow up on that, like we've, the city central services um, um, commissioned a whole study of all the school buildings and there's a much bigger conversation to be had about that as opposed to just you know doing maintenance or upgrades um, at all the schools so that will certainly be forthcoming um, <clears throat> um okay so oh sorry rachel yeah uh yeah I'm, I'm tempted to comment on that because i think what we you know i think there's a five-year plan that talks about educational goals and the infrastructure of the schools really that is what i feel is we're missing in the conversation to be very frank if our enrollment keeps dropping we should not be investing in all these schools in the way that we are i'm not saying that's what i want but i think we need you know we can't have these conversations be separate we really need a five-year uh you know holistic plan for our educational goals in schools. Okay, that's out of the way. I just wanted to comment on these funds and how lost I feel about them. I've, this is my second term serving. I didn't know my first term we even had funds and I never seen any kind of, um, you know, mission statement around them or stipulation. So I feel a little at a loss about it. I don't feel, I mean, it, it, this doesn't feel great you know, in terms of the steam traps, I, it's not such an amount that I would say no to that, but I, I feel like we really need a proactive plan. And I think partly they're not being used the way we want them to be used because we haven't decided what exactly what that looks like. And perhaps that should be the next conversation we have, what, whether whatever we do with this, um, you know, this item. It, I don't know if it's just me, but I've never been kind of onboarded around this money. <laughs> So I can just to clarify specifically there, this is authorized in the code. Um, 
allowable expenditures include materials, expenses, contracted services associated with projects and programs and policies that increase the level of energy efficiency and energy resource sustainability and guard against effects of energy resource disruption, depletion and climate change in all of the Northampton's public and private sectors consistent with the goals of sustainable Northampton plan and the city's climate change uh, protection commitments and other city plans and goals. Yeah, so I guess the way I feel is I agree with Gordon, this doesn't feel great. I don't, I, I see the practical problem and I, I, I'm, I'm, I have some compassion for that and would, I don't think this is gonna make or break us. So I, I would, um, I could support this if, if we have a proactive conversation about how we specifically want to spend this money, not wait, you know, but really sit down, like can make that our priority, one of our priorities on this, you know, commission to specifically identify projects instead of just kind of waiting for them to be, I think Gordon is correct. I think they're getting eaten up, but, it, but he's also correct that we haven't been putting much forward. It was, it's been really exciting talking that our next agenda item about you know the pollinators because there's some money. I tried to do this last year with the pollinate, pollinator with very little money, you know, pollinator uh, program. So I can see how it could be really useful the money. So I guess I'm saying that I would support this if if we can really make you know if we can um, decide that we're going to to, to make this a, a, a agenda you know a priority you know priority on our agenda to 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 decide very specifically where we want to go with this money. That's my thought. Can I just, just offer that, um, so I'm, I'm going to vote for uh, spending the money, um, mostly because it will probably, the $10,000 will probably pay itself back in one year. Um, this is my request is, or question is, how come that $10,000 can't, since it is going to pay for itself, why can't it get put back into the kitty once it does pay for itself? Um, because then at least, yeah, we haven't really lost anything and now we can invest it in something <laughs> that's their long-term investment. I mean, I suppose that could be a request of the city council to transfer funds into that fund, but it doesn't automatically have, I mean, I think it would be, then it would just go through as a sort of, uh, um regular um, re um request although it might need to be authorized in the ordinance to allow that to happen first so okay we there's have, a oh, I'm go sorry. ahead i'm sorry i should have raised my hand we do have time uh we can wait um i feel bad now <laughs> Feels like it's dirty money and I don't want to touch it. <laughs> uh, somebody should, no. I don't know. I, I think uh, Rachel has a good point. Maybe we should define how this, these funds are being used. I agree, you don't want to pilfer the money and then end up not being able to use it for what it's really meant for. And I'm not sure Chris would be sitting here asking for this money from this account. I don't know. I'm, I'm having a little bit of a learning curve here. So, um, Maybe it should be tabled, you know, because you're bringing up valid points. <laughs> Just to make well, it I just want to say it's not your fault that the steam system. traps need to be clean, though. It's not. It's not yeah, your you know. It's it's just municipal governance, and and this is how it always is. It's not on you, Pat. And, and yeah. we are talking about tens of thousands of dollars in savings. Yeah. By repairing them, I mean that's that is true. <laughs> It's just frustrating to repair a system that we wish we didn't. I have. agree with you. Yeah, and I and I yeah, I do agree. It's it is maintenance. And maybe maybe this account should not be used for maintenance. You're you're bringing me over to your side. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh I, I do think that like it's it's you know worth considering a policy and if that's the policy that we come up with or you know then it is fine as it is now it seems to me that there's a need there's a saving that is is appropriate to the function of the fund um even if it's not the best solution and you know and and it's not currently you know defined as out, outside of this so I, you know i'd be in favor 
I, I think we should go ahead and, and do this. I mean, it's, it's amazing the way these different committees and things that I, you know, that I, as I see the way we all kind of talk around issues and then, and, and often surprisingly come to um, central solutions, you know, that, um, that are dealt with at the, at the bigger level and that are put into action by the council or the government, the gov mayor and all that sort of stuff. So I agree. It's not your fault. The traps need to be done. <laughs> I also think that we, we should go ahead and, and pay for it this time, but I think that maybe we need to make that policy that moving forward, this fund isn't for maintenance, but it's, it's for strategic investment. And I, I completely agree with Rachel. We need to we need to actually make that a priority of this commission. We have this money. We need to find a way to deploy it into the community. Yeah, I, I tend to want to support Ben's idea there. I don't know. I am um, so perhaps we. I don't know if we can vote for it and then figure out how to do that. Ben's idea, you know, about suggestion that we get reinvested. Um, so uh, I would. You know, I, I could vote for it, um, but I, I really like that idea of of it being um, reinvested back, you know, back into the commission's fund. So I guess we, I, you know, that's maybe that's an Alan Seawald question. Carolyn, I'm not I'm really sure, but. I mean, yeah, I don't think it would be that yeah complicated to to figure out whether it would need sort of a two-step process or not okay. that's something we can you know look into okay so we can add a request we could approve this and add a request i guess we could have to amend the motion on the floor to add that request or and i don't know well if, i mean like ben and i are interested in it yeah i mean the other thing is i think it probably is cleaner just to move the question about whether you're going to fund it and then the second thing is have staff evaluate whether the savings or some kind of, um, you know, comparable amount to the savings can be, um, can go to restocking the pot. Okay, so there's a motion on the floor and a second. Are you all ready to do a roll call vote? Okay. Um, Louie. Yes. Marissa. Yes. Uh, Rachel. Yes. Uh, Pat. I get the vote, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, ben. Yes. Um, Gordon. Yes. And I will vote yes as well. So that passes unanimously. That would have been some drama if Pat voted against it. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I've learned something today. <laughs> That's what any, every meeting's for. Um, okay, next up. Um, pollinator subcommittee report. Um, Rich Parcelletti was going to be here to um, talk about this along with Gordon. He is attending to a sick family member, so he couldn't come. Um, so, um, Gordon, if you want to go ahead and present that and the information, obviously, that he passed on via email right before the meeting, that would be great. Yeah, and let's not leave Rachel out of this because she has been integral part of this and she may be necessary for uh, translating some of the acronyms in the email that Rich sent us. I may okay. have figured it out. Um, so we have been trying to figure out, how, initially we started off as the mowing subcommittee and we were looking at our mowing practices and at some point we decided we didn't like that name. So um, what we are trying to do is to change mode space around the city that's mode only for the purpose of, um, you know, the way that it looks. It's just ornamental, it's mode, that's just how it's been always, and that's why we do it. And what we're trying to do is to convert that over to uh, pollinator meadows. And so uh, we have, we've started meeting with different department heads and taking a look at the space that is currently mowed uh, all around the city and 
we've come up very quickly with a whole lot of great potential sites to switch from being mowed over to being pollinator habitat. Um, and we, we've talked about a number of different methods for doing that. We've talked about just allowing those areas to rewild and allow the seeds to naturally come in and then simply go through and remove the woody structure every two years, which would be a hand tooling process and could be handled by existing staff. And the savings that uh, we would get out of doing this are really quite significant. So we would be eliminating the weekly mowing costs of any area that we convert over to pollinator habitat we wouldn't need the person riding the mower and we wouldn't need the gas pushing the, the mower either. And so what we're really looking to do is to both save money for the city and to generate a whole bunch of pollinator habitat around the city to help with all of the problems that we all know are happening with that. So uh, Smith Boak has really generously offered uh, us a demonstration project. They are going to convert one of the fields uh, that is, right, I'm sorry, I'm spacing on exactly where it is, but it's, um, it's, it's right across from the like golf driving range kind of place. Is it's, that yeah, correct? Yeah, it's, it's in Ward 7. It's, you know, that section down from the Beth Hospital, um, the Veteran Medical Center, there's an open uh, kind of piece of land owned by Smith Folk. So that is exciting. Yeah, you can see it right from the road, right from. Uh, yeah, the yep. so it's it's five acres and we have at least double that on offer already from different department heads around the city. I believe Smith Voke alone will give us quite a lot more than that eventually uh, to, to dedicate to this process. And it, it's also really good for restoring the land. You know, the land needs to rest in order to be agriculturally viable. And so any land that we're, we're doing this project with, were it ever needed for agricultural purposes in the future, future generations can then till this up and use it, and it will be much healthier than it, it, it is going into the current, uh, going into this system. Um, so what we are, we are at actually looking to do is to access some of the funds that we just granted for the steam traps to go towards pollinator habitat creation. And we're, we're going to uh, use that for buying seed. Uh, it would both be bulk seed for places like uh, the Smith Voke field, and it would also be seed packets that would be given away. And so this is this is really Rich's arena, but he has been. Uh, we, we the last meeting we kicked around the idea of um, putting this effort under the Urban Forestry Commission um, because it is really urban forestry that we're doing. Meadows or wildlands, just like the the woods are, um, and so we have gotten the exciting agreement that we can give away seed packs at the Arbor Day. Uh, event alongside of giving away all of the trees. Uh, so I think the city gives away 600 trees on Arbor Day. Um, and so we are going to give away uh, seed packets for people to convert their lawn space over to mowed area. Um, and one of the things that, there, there's a couple things that have continually come up with this process. We have been talking about um, some kind of signage that we could maybe potentially provide for residents to put in their yards in areas which they are rewilding just to let the neighborhood know that they are not simply abandoning their yard or trying to make a mess, uh, but that they are actively cultivating an environment in their yard that they think is better than mowed grass. And and so I think that we would like to see some uh, funding to help pay for signage, uh, as well as for seeds um, and uh, other such things. And, and, and with that, let me pass it over to Rachel to see what I have forgotten to mention. Oh, you got it. That, so the acronym, <laughs> yeah, it's just Tree Northampton. You know, the idea is just using the volunteer infrastructure that's, that's, that really shines here in Northampton which is Tree Northampton and, and the Urban Forestry Commission and their relationship, so why not? And, and luckily, Sue Lofthouse is, um, you know, is on board with that. That was great news. So yeah, no, you covered it. It, it, it would be, uh, you know, something we can, uh, you know, 
build upon every year, but this is a good place to start. And I, yeah, it was exciting to think of a, a, a good reason, you know, really, well, at least a very clear, uh, a clear reason to use uh, um, NESC funds um, for something like this. And um, so that's, yeah, we're gonna be coming to you. I don't know, Gordon, I guess we're still, coming up with the amount I think of, I think that we've got I think that we've got a pretty good idea of it yeah uh, it looks like we need about five thousand dollars worth of seeds yeah. um and that I think that we could probably use another say three thousand dollars to help fund uh efforts towards creating small amounts of like signage to give away or something or at least coming up with designs and demonstration uh signage so that we could kind of flesh out the idea of how to kind of integrate this effort into the community i think that's really what it's about is how do we how do we do this while kind of making a statement that this is what we're doing in everyone's yards to allow them to say we're we're directly trying to create pollinator habitat here in northampton uh both in our larger Spaces, but also in our residential neighborhoods. And I think that it's something that we could be proud of. I think that it that that additional money would be good for helping to to really show the community what what the purpose of what we're doing is. Yeah, I well, thought that. Um, can I just clarify? I thought that Rich said about five thousand dollars, but you're saying five thousand plus three thousand. I think that we should add a few thousand dollars to. Yeah, if we do just five thousand, we're going to run out of money at seeds. Uh, and, and I think that we would end up having a few hundred dollars to spare, and I don't really think that it's going to be enough to to For actually signage. create create any kind of marketing materials that are going to be needed with this effort. So I think that we need the other three thousand dollars to to at least get that effort started. Um, it sounds like three thousand dollars a lot is a lot for marketing and signs, um, but I don't know if anybody's been looking um, at you know at those costs and and also wondering what kinds of, if any thought has been put into yeah. the signage um, and where that, that could, would go, how big it is. That could that could that could be used for buying more seeds. That way, we don't have to come back to the whole group to ask for money again when we get enough say we get somebody to donate uh a whole bunch more land to this effort do do you think that we should have to come i mean and this is a genuine question does this commission feel like we should come back every single time someone agrees to give us more land to ask the commission for more seeds or do we think that because we're that's going to happen regularly um or should we have enough money set aside to buy additional seeds or to do additional signage or whatever we need uh, we're talking we just approved ten thousand dollars for steam traps are utterly unrelated we're talking about a few thousand dollars for signage for an effort to make pollinator habitat like is that that's the hill that we want to die on um yeah i wasn't suggesting you die on anything but um i just didn't know if signs are part of the energy piece or if it's pollinator habitat and energy, it, it would make sense to me that you would have a better idea of how much is really going to something that's not really supporting the pollinator habitat um it, but it, it it actually directly supports the effort to to let people know that hey i have put this pollinator habitat in my yard you can do the same thing by contacting nesc or by contacting the the uh urban forestry commission you know that way people know where to reach out um are there other committee members that oh, ben go to you and then we can take public comment hey, just a quick question about about the money um and the process sounds to me like this is a start and you've got like you know certain properties have been um committed uh to it and you've kind of figured out the amount of seed you need for that what would be wrong with uh doing you know doing essentially the pilot version and getting maybe a few signs and seeing maybe there's no take up of those signs that we would hate to spend money on a bunch of signs that actually turned out were not needed or we might find out a month later wow those signs disappeared everybody wants them we need it, the funding like it, so it just seems like it's actually yeah, not the three so the three thousand dollars 
$3,000 would just barely get us started. Uh, I have done signage research. It's not cheap. You're, you're talking about like uh, $10 a sign typically. And we're, we're going to be getting 2,000 seed packets. You know, right. the, but just the so uptake the, of the signs may or may not be what you anticipate. So I'm just imagining why not see how it goes and you come back to us in a month and say, hey, it's going great. We need X number. The, the timing is important. I, I guess the signs are not the most critical thing at this juncture. We need to get the money right now for for getting the seeds. Uh, but I really think that signage is a really critical part of this effort. We have to have a forward facing element to this effort that tells people in the community that we are doing this so that they know where to reach out to find seeds for themselves so that it creates buy-in for the program. And, and the purpose of getting those out there, those signs out there is for adoption. It's a, it's a low cost effort to try to make a major impact. Uh, Gordon, just a process note that I think we were talking about Alicia Purdy, who's a, um, one of those stellar volunteers at Tree Northampton, who's also a graphic designer, and she did our No Mo May signs last year. I think we were discussing maybe running it by her. She knows the kind of materials, and she's the, you know she also has her design. But I'm just wondering if we have time. I mean, we, this is a really short turnaround in terms of time, but we could probably get a little bit more specific on the side. I totally agree we need signage. Uh, but maybe she could give us a, a more specific, you know, figure on the signage. I think that we can be certain that hiring a graphic designer to design the signs is going to, and I think we're probably going to need a couple different kinds of signs, because I think that we should put something out by the Smith Vogue demonstration field as well that's larger. I think that sign design is probably going to cost us uh you know, say five hundred to a thousand dollars reasonably, and then a, a larger sign for out by Smith Road could easily cost uh, five hundred dollars, and uh, and then yard signs. Say we say we give out, uh, say we just get a, a fifty a run of fifty done at first. It's still going to be five hundred dollars for fifty yard signs at a minimum. Um, so the the costs start to like to stack up there to where I, I'm uncomfortable, you know, saying that three I don't think that three thousand dollars to go towards signage or more seeds is an unreasonable ask here. We're, you know, it's eight thousand dollars. We have a hundred. We have a hundred and fifteen thousand dollars to spend out of this out of this fund. We just spent 10 of it on steam traps. I'm asking for eight. This is the first time that anyone on this board has ever asked for money towards an actual sustainability project in my recollection of five years on this commission. So uh, I'm asking for $8,000 towards this. I just want to say I'm listening, but I have to get in the car, but you'll see me, but I'm going to switch to the phone. I'm here and yeah. we're running out of our um, meeting time too. I just want to throw in one more plug and then I'll go to Helen and um, Teresa. Um, and I think I, Louis might have some comments about this as well, but yard signs become trash. And the, I really I feel strongly about generating a ton of signs for something that could also, you could, there are many other formats to do it now. Having like a demonstration farm, like, you know, at Smith Vogue or some of the other, um, you know, sort of larger sites um, and having a dedicated sign there, totally, I can totally understand that. But I really do worry about generating all these like um, campaign type of signs that do end up becoming trash. And I'll just leave it at that as I, sort of a I thought to, to sort of think about in terms of where money 
is probably better spent. Like there could be a web campaign and um, on the city website with a map showing where all these places are going. So that's yeah, all. So that's a, that's a great idea. So I think we need fifteen thousand dollars then, because I think that we need to do that too. Um, and I totally agree that making trash would be a terrible idea. So what I would propose on that would be that we use the money to come up with signed designs, and then we come back to this greater commission to, to get signed design approval, uh, because that we could have, uh, we would have enough time to get that ready for maybe the next meeting, but we need the money to at least do the design now so that we can have designs available for the next meeting so that these could be useful for this growing season because time matters for for the growing season so we're going to be just we would like to be distributing these seeds along with arbor day right and i don't hear any problem with anyone as far as the seed costs go but as far as the signage goes i think that having everyone's buy-in on the signs is probably a great idea and uh, so could we please have the money for the sign design now so that and, and actually for a little bit of the sign production again that it's eight thousand dollars the can we have the money for the sign design so that everyone's cool with it um okay well, let's take some public comment uh, helen Hi there, thank you. Um, I think the hands that are up most likely are from plant people. I know one of them is for sure. Um, and I, as a Northampton resident, I'm really thrilled with the idea of, of a, a high visibility pollinator project um, that's communicated to, to the town as a whole. I have a feeling though, based on the conversation that the, the cart is in front of the horse here. And, and this is why I'm saying that. It's not that easy. Um, you, you have a whole lot of considerations about how to tran transition landscape from one kind of uh, purpose to another. And um, there's plenty of information out there about um, the complexities. And one of the concerns is uh, opening up your, your, um, your landscape to invasive species and how that gets controlled. So, and not, not all land takes the same kind of, of uh, plant to begin with. So seeds um, aren't necessarily um, the, the right way to go for everybody or not the same seeds in any event. So I, I will stop there because I, I want to hear from the other two, but I feel like there needs to be a lot more science behind this. And there are, than what I've heard today so far, Sure. And so there are a lot of um, um, experienced folks in this community um, who know a lot about pollinator planting and how to make it happen. So I'd love to hear that they're being pulled in um, as as consultants and experts. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so Teresa. much, Helen. No, actually, I'm going to respond. So um, I just wanted to invite you to uh to please come to the subcommittee uh meetings uh we announce the subcommittee meetings every month uh rich is the one who's in charge of getting those out and we have been meeting for uh six months now to discuss the science behind these efforts and i am so glad that you brought that up we have been talking about invasive species management and how we can transition from mowing to invasive species management We've, talking, we've been talking about our different land types and the types of plants that we need to be introducing to them. And we've been talking about how to uh, manage whether we're using seed plug, whether we're using plant plugs or whether we're using seeds. And that's actually all being determined on a, a piece of land by piece of land basis. And we could use all the help that we can get. So please come to the next meeting. That, it's wonderful to see you here. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Teresa? Hi, um, I'm Teresa. I'm a member of the um, Grow Food Northampton Community Garden. And um, I just feel like Northampton is very fortunate to have um, such a you know large number of agricultural and um, just growing people, plant people, I guess, um, in the area. 
Um, specifically, I wanted to say also that um, what sounds most interesting is the um, test plots or the demonstration project that um, the kids will be doing at Smith Folk. Um, you know, I, I think that sounds pretty cool just to kind of see how it goes in different areas. Um, and that would be, I guess I'm always asking myself, how can I get the community, community involved? And that might be a project that you would be able to generate a lot of um, interest in, you know, just from the average person in Northampton. Um, and not to mention other school kids. I mean, that almost really um, could be curriculum, you know, part of a curriculum. Um, the other thing I wanted to say <clears throat> is that North uh, Grow Food Northampton gives seeds away every year, and we still are trying to give seeds away from like 1986. So I'm not sure I would get 2,000 packets of anything. That's a lot. Um, and, you know, people in Northampton, it's not like we're living in a big city. There's lots and lots and lots of access um, to flower seeds. Um, a ton of people just give them away. You can write and just get them mailed to you for free. Um, the other thing is that if when you do give away seeds, I think again how to get people involved. Um, you know that might be a time for a postcard sized um, invitation for them to join you at the Smith Folk, you know, demonstration project or provide, you know, we we have a sense of why people want to stop mowing their lawn, but that can send some people for a loop. Um, you know, so just you know with that seed kit, an explanation of the rationale, and then it's so much more than a seed kit, you know, which, um, you know, is available free almost everywhere. That, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, um, so, we, so, so we, uh, one of the reasons that I'm, I'm really pushing hard right now for signage Teresa is so that it helps us with the effort of giving these seeds out and getting them out into the community. I think that that's really important point that you've had a hard time giving out the seeds. I think that we need to make this like a truly, uh, you know, a, a more aggressive effort as a city to actually get these seeds out into the community. And by using the signage, I hope uh, to have more success. And we would love to learn from everything that you have done so far. And I, I would ask you to also please come to the subcommittee meetings. I think that would be really nice. Um, I also think just the last thing is that, um, you know, I think the way you make, uh, you know, Grow Food Northampton is very well connected and very structured and they are, you know, pretty well connected in people with people that want seeds. And I think the way you give away seeds or start a program like this, instead of signs, although signs are maybe, um, it might be nice to have, uh, and I don't want to get involved in your sign argument, but it wouldn't, I wouldn't want that to be in lieu of actually physically going to this church, that church, this, you know, picnic, that school, because I think that's how you make the connection with people who you want to have do something big and new. So I don't think a sign does that. I think it's person to person, one to one, tete-a-tete. -tete. Okay. okay, that's that's really Thanks, great. That's really great feedback. Yeah, and I just want to let you know, we're past our time for the meeting. So Denise, if you want to speak quickly, and then we've got to um, zip through this discussion and figure out what we're going to do with the rest of the items on the agenda. Go ahead, Denise. Okay, thank you. I'll be really brief. Um, I do... I uh, want to agree with a number of things that um, Helen and Therese said. I think um, this is a larger question, so I can't really go into it here, but I do think communication with uh, the people of Northampton about what's happening with this commission in general um, would be really helpful. One of the ways that we could uh, assist with that, um, I work with a group called Mothers Out Front. I know um, 
Therese uh, also, as she mentioned, works with uh, Grow Food Northampton. So there are a lot of organizations that you can use. And we table at events like um, the plant sale, which is on the Smith Boat property. And you could uh, have uh, people familiar with the location for the demonstration. You could use that as an opportunity to educate people. We also table at things like um, the Forbes Garden um, uh, show, uh, walk. So, you know, um, I just uh, hope you'll take think about taking advantage of some of these other kinds of communication opportunities. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we, we would love, again, that, so I, I think that something is, re it's really important to see this for what it is. This is really the beginning of an effort. Um, I'm excited about it. I'm excited that Rachel and Rich have been helping out so much with this and getting it going. And, and one thing that has come up in every one of our discussions is our need to uh, bring in as many uh, community members into this effort as possible because we know there are so many people committed to this effort already. And it is our desire to help with that effort, to join into that effort, to provide some uh, some strength to that effort uh, and and to really make it eventually make it something that that the city is really putting itself behind that we want we stand for this in this community that we stand for creating pollinator habitat. And I think that really is directly in line with our mission uh, here on this commission and, and so I'm hopeful that we will dedicate the ample resources to it that it deserves. And with that I would make a motion to request $8,000 uh, for the uh, pollinator efforts being made by the subcommission to provide seeds and signage and people power that's necessary to begin this effort. There's that second. I would second that. Was that Rachel? Okay, thank you. It was. Thank you. Okay, any um, discussion on the motion? Okay. Um, Marissa raised her hand. Marissa? Yeah. I just, um, I mean, I just want to put it out there, uh, and I've already been told once I'm negative today. Um, so, I'll, but um, I, I'm, I'm not. I can't vote for this. I don't. It, it just seems uh, the project and the pollination. I'm completely behind, uh, and um, this uh, does not seem uh, the proposal and the use of the money does not seem uh, fully, fully formed. Um, sufficient to spend that amount of money. So um, I just wanted to put it out there um, and, and well, explain why well, my vote. You want to do this is not a debate. This is not a debate, Gordon. This is I'm, I'm just letting you know what my position is. And and and, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm one of the electeds here. So I feel like I you know need to 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 put, you know, put it on the record. But um, I, I'm not really open to persuasion on the point at this late hour. Um, today, but I, you know, I, I do hope uh, a, uh, a different proposal comes before us um, that is maybe given to us in advance with a little more laid out about what is being we asked, proposed we, and being we suggested this at many previous meetings. We knew that this was this request was coming. We talked about this at the last meeting, and and, right. and, and, and Gordon, you don't win every vote. Uh, so can I just I, I one quick question? Did, yes. you, did you want a per um, uh, propose an amendment to the motion, or do you just would you like I, to asking, uh, maybe yes. see a? I, I'm not done. Thank you. Um, would you like to? Are you suggesting that maybe um, a more um, specific um, request come forward at the next meeting so that there's and in advance so that it can be evaluated for I would, sort of I'd be fine item with that. expenditure. I would be fine okay. with that. This is Rachel, and I'm so sorry, but I, I'm I'm also a little stressed because I actually am picking people up and I actually can't stay. So I wonder okay. if you couldn't maybe yeah. Okay. We need the seeds. We need the seeds for planting now. 
We need to order them now. We need they need to be in by the next okay. meeting. Okay. So right. what I would have... what I would say is that I could amend this. I could amend to ask for five thousand dollars for the seeds, and we can bring back up the signage. And I wonder if that would assuage anyone's concerns. So you may you moved um, um, an amendment to the original motion for five thousand dollars for seeds only. Yes. Is there a second to that amendment? A second. Okay, Louis, second, and I'll take a roll call. Um, Louis. Yes. Uh, ben. No. Um, Gordon. Yes. Um, Rachel. Yes. Pat. Yes. Did I hear you say yes? Okay. Um, and um, I would vote yes for this um, seed packs. And if signs need to come back, if you want to come back for another amendment, that would be it. So let me just make sure. So that was two opposed. Um, you didn't call me. I didn't. I'm sorry. Marissa. Sorry. Marissa. Yes. Okay. So, um, all right. So I think that passes. Um, yes. So six to one. Okay. Um, there was one other item on the agenda. Um, and I don't know. Rachel has to go. We still would have a quorum. Um, an update on the um, House and Senate bills for community aggregation. Um, we didn't have this sent ahead of time, so maybe it makes sense to send it along for the next meeting and put it on the next agenda. So I would um, move that we do that um, at the given the lateness of the hour. Second. Pat, second. Um, uh, roll call, Ben. Yes. Uh, Marissa? Yes. Louie? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Rachel? And Pat. <laughs> she may have already gone. Okay. Great. And then a uh, motion to adjourn. Second. So moved. Okay. Great. Um, ben? When is the next yes. meeting? Marissa? Yes. Uh, Louis? Yes. Pat? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Okay. Um, that passes. Um, and then just as an FYI, our next meeting is the regularly scheduled, whatever it is, third Tuesday, April. <laughs>